Thank you, everyone. So, <clears throat> following on from Martin's talk earlier, when he talked to us about the importance of audit trails, it's with great pleasure that I introduce Andrew Eland, uh, one of my colleagues and our Director of Engineering, to talk to us about some of his thoughts recently on transparency and audit within health data. Andrew. Thanks, Ken. Um, so uh, I run engineering for DeepMind Health. Um, I'm not going to talk much about, uh, or at all, about what DeepMind Health are doing. Um, given I have the, the honor, dubious honor maybe, of being the last speaker in the room of the day, um, I was going to try to pull together some of the, the threads that have been mentioned um, and try to talk maybe um, about one hypothetical way we could plug together systems to achieve the, uh, the journey of Michael, the patient that uh, we've been talking about. Um, and so I'm not really going to talk about obviously keeping um, health data safe. There's a lot of basic things involving, you know, encryption and rest, encryption in transit, firewalls, those kind of things. Um, that's pretty <laughs> basic stuff, I think. So uh, I'm not going to cover that. Instead, um, I'd like to talk through a little bit about how you plug these components together as a system, um, and maybe a little about what parts of the system haven't been invented yet, but we need to invent um, in this connected world. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, building on what uh, many of the themes that uh, Adam mentioned earlier in his talk um, and uh, take uh, the patient journey uh, and try to say one possible way of solving that with um, a few principles. Um, and so a couple of principles as we come across to kind of pull this together is that um, uh, many clinicians and patients need to aggregate uh, medical data that's held in many different places into one place so they can actually have a consistent view of that patient. Um, and I don't believe that that single aggregate view of a patient can ever be stored in one single repository. Um, not necessarily from a technical perspective. I mean, if you just compute the raw numbers of the amount of data you need to hold for everybody in the UK and the latency characteristics, it's not actually a significant amount of data. <clears throat> it's more of a challenge of when you try to design a single system to meet all of those use cases, you are guaranteed to fail. Um, plus, even if you didn't fail, you'd have to migrate people across to that system from the state where we are now. And if the first didn't fail, the second thing definitely would fail because you can't build, you can't just inject something that complicated into, into such a complicated distributed environment. So I don't think we're ever gonna end up in a world where we can just simplify out to a single data repository. Um, I think that um, as Martin talked about earlier, that, that ultimately like patient consent decisions will have a strong influence on what these aggregate views look like. And there's no one aggregate view. Everybody will see a different aggregate view depending on the choices that that patient has made or that choices organizations have made on behalf of that patient. Um, and it should be technically possible to verify that those choices have been respected by the whole system. Um, and ideally, all of this should be built on top of open standards through FIRE. Um, so uh, I think the, the, the use case uh, we talked about earlier with Michael um, talks about this medication manager application. So let's talk about how we could potentially build that. Um, so one way of building that is um, you could have the medication manager application. Um, it would talk to a particular fire endpoint, as David described earlier. And that fire endpoint could, for example, aggregate together um, existing data that sits within a particular hospital. Uh, and so on the diagram there, you see the green bits are through an open fire standard. Um, and then everything else behind the scenes is uh, proprietary. Um, and so actually, this is uh, exactly how the streams application uh, at the Royal Free works. Um, but of course, uh, just getting access to the data itself uh, is uh, one small part of the problem. You also need uh, authorization to access this data. Um, and the obvious way to do that is through a second standard called OAuth. Um, so OAuth is a standard used for gaining access to resources. Um, it's not related to FHIR necessarily. It's used by many, many, many different tech companies. Um, if you have used uh, sites that say log in via Google, log in via Facebook, log in via Twitter, it bounces you off to a second site. It says uh, this site would like to know your email address so that you can log in. You say OK, it bounces back. That protocol under the covers is OAuth. Um, and uh, the same can be applied to fire. Uh, and so you can imagine a second uh, endpoint that the patient, uh, with their application, they log into the application via OAuth. Um, when you log in via OAuth, 
Um, you uh, give your credentials, i.e. your username and password. Uh, and you also say, I would like to access this data. Um, so for example, um, in the case I mentioned earlier, you could say, I would like to access the email address that you currently hold for me. Um, and in the case of Fire, you could say, I would like to view uh, my patient record. So you log in by OAuth. OAuth validates your username and password somehow um, if it's correct, um, and the, uh, the scope that you're asking for, the rights to see uh, a particular record is valid, it will send you back a token. And a token is a cryptographic piece of data that you then you can exchange um, in return for data. So your authentication system doesn't actually hold any patient data. All it does is say, um, I can tell whether or not a patient has consented uh, for this choice to be made. Um, so, um, there are some issues with the road. So the use of OAuth and Fire is actually standardized. If you look through the uh, Fire DSQ specification, it talks about a, a profile called Smart on Fire. Smart on Fire is a set of extensions on top of Fire. One of the things it talks about is specifically how you would integrate these two things together to provide authentication into Fire. The second is it defines what these scopes are. And these scopes are quite important because that's effectively the basis of consent. It's, for example, says one of the things you can ask for is to see blood test results for a particular patient or for all patients, um, that kind of thing. Um, from the particular use case that uh, we're talking about this story of, of a patient facing uh, application, um, one of the challenges here is that FHIR has really been designed around clinical use cases. And so not a lot of work has been thought into what are the correct levels of consent or scope that you need to access data on behalf of a patient. Um, uh, and so I think we need a lot more work in that in future for this particular model to work because um, as this story talks about later, perhaps you want to only grant access for an application to a subset of uh, the data it holds about you, not all of the data. Um, so I think the story goes on to say that Michael would like to restrict access to uh, some medical data, potentially that he's bought over the counter to uh, a smaller number of people than otherwise. Um, one way you could potentially build this um, in the same way that we have here, you could extend the FHIR standard to have kind of access control lists so that when you scan a medicine in your medication manager app, it posts back to your single medical record and says, yes, I have just taken this medication. And perhaps if you wanted to restrict access, you could then build the functionality on top of FHIR that doesn't yet exist yet to say, but I only want to show this to um, uh, a smaller number of people. Um, I think in practice, what would happen, just as these things evolve, um, is that you'd end up with a system that looks more, much more like this. Um, you would end up with a medication manager application, for example, that um, uh, a particular user has, um, that talks through a custom API, as talked about earlier, some custom protocol designed by the people who make the application to a database. And so that database here, um, now holds a subset of the patient data. It holds specifically the patient data that the patient has entered themselves on the application. Um, then your doctor at the bottom, a clinical app, could be something like Streams, could be something else. It now needs to get an aggregate view of the current state of that patient. Uh, and so the way it would have to do that is it could make a request via Fire and Open Standards to the hospital systems. And those hospital systems would say, well, I know about the medications that were given in hospital. I now need to go off and find data about medications stored in other places, for example, this medication manager, mix those together, um, and then send it back to the clinical application to give back this, this overview. Um, and the key thing there is that it would happen through patient consent. So the same authentication mechanism I mentioned earlier is still there. So for this to work, um, the patient themselves will have to, in their medication app manager application, say, I consent to share this data with the particular, um, you know, for these particular cases. And that could include, for example, with their healthcare provider. And it would be up to the developers of the medication manager application to decide at what level they wanted to draw that. Um, and uh, when the clinical application actually starts to pull back and aggregate together uh, a total view for the clinicians, um, maybe that uh, request for data would be authorized or maybe not, depending on the patient's choices. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit about the next part of the story. The next part of the story was we would like to um, 
take uh, not only pulse gather uh, medical data, but also automatically check for bad drug interactions. So automatically be able to say, um, do I have drugs that I'm using that have um, poor interaction patterns between them? And so any one of these systems could implement it themselves. But let's talk through an example where a third party system does that. So some novel company, maybe using AI, I don't know, um, decides that they're going to build out the world's best system for testing drug um, interactions. Um, and so what this system would look like is that you have a third party system uh, who build an engine that could check for drug interactions. Um, that basically needs to pull together a uniform view of what that uh, patient is, is taking with respect to drugs, um, uh, merge that together, and then run its uh, rules to say whether or not those, um, uh, whether or not any of those drugs conflict before sending advice back to the clinical system. Um, and so in these cases, think about the consent uh, application that's happening. Um, perhaps uh, in the hospital case, which is down at the bottom where your healthcare provider is, is outsourcing uh, that role to a third party, perhaps that consent is implied, as in when you're in hospital, they're saying, we need to do this for your direct care, therefore um, we are delegating rights to a third party application to access your data in return for providing the actual value for direct care to clinicians. Um, but maybe you explicitly um, maybe the patient explicitly in the cases of the separate medical data contained in their own application, they would grant explicit permission to that. So you've got this mixture there of some consent is explicitly um, provided through one application and some is delegated automatically. Um, so there's a couple of issues there that I'll talk about later. Is obviously like consent management is now getting quite complicated because you've got consent in multiple different places that you have to aggregate together. That's clearly difficult. Um, the second is how does this medication interaction engine actually know where the data is? Like it doesn't know which which endpoints contain data for a particular patient. First one is probably easier. The second one is probably easier to solve than the first. Um, so what you need, as Adam alluded to earlier, is some kind of discovery service that doesn't exist yet. So this is some kind of service that you'd say, please tell me which fire endpoints or who holds information about this patient. Don't need to know what data it is, just tell me who holds it. And that would allow an interaction engine to go off and query and say, OK, now I know who could potentially hold this data together. Let's go back together and aggregate it together into one particular view. Um, so I've said that this is a now we've kind of moved away from kind of open standards. This is more of a community thing. So this discovery mechanism, the way it could work would be for open standards, but to participate in it, it's a community thing. You know, maybe it's something that interopen eventually ends up uh, actually running. Maybe this is something that NHS England or NHS Digital wants to support. But is it actually a physical service that is not only protocols, but something that runs somewhere um, that uh, tells you who holds data about what particular person? There are many different ways you could build this. Um, one could be just give me a list of everybody I could potentially have to query to find out data about this patient, which would be pretty dumb, simple to implement, doesn't have to uh, store any data. Another could be um, a bit more complicated. It could actually track who has information about which particular patient, so it's slightly more efficient to query. Um, you could even imagine that this, this service actually just looks like another fire endpoint that sits and aggregates data together. Um, in many ways, it's very similar to uh, the domain name service. So this is a service that, for example, when you type Amazon.com or DeepMind.com into your browser, the thing that actually tells you uh, who to talk to. It's a very similar kind of um, piece of functionality. Um, so we need to build that. That's, I think, the easier of the two problems. Um, the second is the consent part of it, because really, um, we uh, had a system there, this medical interaction engine, that is processing data both under explicit consent in one case, potentially under direct care and implied consent in the other case. Um, you need to find some kind of way of, uh, the way it's in at the moment, you have to trust that system. That system has to say, we will only process um, your medication history um, in order to find out if there are any interactions. Um, but you know, it has rights to pull that data. So the question is, how do you actually verify that that system is actually doing what it says it's doing and living up to its promise that that's what it says it's going to do with your data. Um, so I think one missing component um, that we have here is a, a verifiable audit log. So this would be every time that you make a request for a particular patient's data, um, you make uh, an entry in a log to say that this piece of data has been uh, requested. Uh, and then we can actually extend the fire standard potentially and say not only do you, does the request get logged, but when you request the data in the first place, 
along with the request, you have to explicitly say in human readable terms why you are requesting the data. So for example, when that drug interaction um, system uh, uh, makes a request, it has to say, I would like to get the medication um, data for this particular person. I do so using these consents as provided by the OAuth system, and I do it because I want to calculate that there is not a bad drug interaction between these drugs. And when it makes that request, that request is then logged into a verifiable order log. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of work recently uh, in the computer science world, um, which is my world since I'm not a clinician, in the last couple of years about um, verifiable data structures, data structures that kind of have integrity properties about them. Probably the most famous um, one is uh, blockchain, uh, as used by currency. Um, but blockchain is only one of a very large family of structures that provide guarantees about their integrity. Um, there are others such as uh, Merkle trees that are a much faster and more efficient way of uh, guaranteeing integrity in the presence of verifiers. So you can imagine a world where every request for patient data and the reason it was requested in the first place is logged in a data structure um, that has guarantees on it about it's ever, whether or not it's ever been tampered with. Um, but of course, you know, just logging that is not very useful. You need an ecosystem of verifiers around it. So um, you can imagine a bunch of verifiers whose job it is to uh, verify two things. One, that this log of requests that have been made uh, for your medical data um, is valid itself, i.e. that no entries within uh, the log have been tampered with or removed. Once the log entry is there, it's there forever. Um, you, an external verifier could actually sit there and continually verify to make sure that that hasn't changed. That's one level of verification. Uh, and that's a level of verification provided by um, data structures like blockchains or micro Merkle trees. Um, the second thing, which is more complicated, is to verify that actually not only have these records not been tampered with, but what was happening in those records meets the constraints of why consent was granted in the first place. Uh, and that's a task that's much more involved, like you're talking like human investigations, kind of similar to perhaps supported by machines in the way that you detect um, fraud uh, at the moment. Um, and so you can imagine building out these verifiable audit logs uh, through um, open standards supported by a community. Um, and then the verifiers themselves, this verification process, um, you would uh, imagine that's a new role that agencies have to play. Uh, so for example, you know, maybe one of these is a trust, maybe it's a hospital, maybe it's a group like Med Confidential. Um, these people could run uh, software that sits and verifies that people are actually making the constraints um, uh, up to date. One of the key kind of differences between, without going into too much of the technical details, between the idea of um, blockchain and other verifiable data structures um, blockchain basically says, we don't trust anybody, therefore, in order for something to be proven true, we want this consensus across everybody who's participating. Um, but really, in reality, you know, in, institutionally, people do trust people. You know, people trust the hospital that they work with. You know, there's probably some organizations that uh, people trust, and therefore, you'd expect these organizations to play a role in actually verifying. It's the same thing that professional standards bodies do at the moment. And so given that we have this trust already, we can actually build much uh, systems much uh, simply and easily to verify these kind of things. Um, so this is a lot of complicated um, uh, work to do. Um, and uh, it's something that we're actually building out internally. So internally at DeepMind Health, we are working on a verify audit log for our own data to basically guarantee that whenever we ourselves as a company move data around, we can guarantee why we have moved it around and go back later and, and verify. And hopefully, in the future, um, we can actually kind of work out, uh, you know, turn that into a standard that we can build upon for other people. Um, you could also imagine that some of these verifiers can actually build patient, clinician, trust facing applications that summarize how a particular patient has been, patient's data has been used. Um, it's just that this is now a provable summary. You've got a summary of all uses throughout the whole system with some guarantees that people have not uh, modified what goes into it. Um, and to be honest, actually, the technical side of this, I mean, it, it, it's a complicated technical piece of infrastructure to build out. It's probably even more complicated to think about the, uh, the user challenges there and the service design because we have to think about, well, you know, this audit log is incredibly sensitive because you're tracking people, what's happening in people's medical data. So that needs a lot of uh, research into how is that log constructed, what particular information goes into it, how do we make it understandable for patients. Um, we're ourselves only just at the beginning of this journey, which I think is, a, is quite a significant challenge for us to, 
to work through. Um, one interesting thing we've been thinking about from the data use summary side of things, you know, perhaps this is an explorer application that lets people explore how their data has been used. Maybe you can integrate it into existing forms of communication. Um, so for example, uh, we've been working with a design agency in London called IF, and so they've been thinking perhaps, you know, there's a lot of um, paper correspondence that goes back and forth between people anyway, and it's kind of expected that when you get discharged, you get a summary of your discharge. Um, perhaps actually you include in there a paper summary of, well, this is what happened to you in hospital, and these are the particular reasons why it's um, happened in any particular case. Um, lots of different ways we could present this, though, and, and lots of exciting research to do to work out what's the best way to make it both understandable and verifiable. Um, so um, the other thing we talked about, I mentioned earlier that um, the consent model was getting relatively complicated because it's quite simple in a world where you have two systems, and each system you provide explicit consent with two other systems. Like the reality is that system is never going to be anywhere near that simple. And so you know, this is just one particular example of a particular area where you have social care, GP, hospital. Um, if each of these systems has its own login process, and I, and I shouldn't underestimate the challenges of the service design around building a login process, especially if you're building it in um, a way to meet the needs of all patients, no matter how digitally literate they are, no matter what their accessibility needs there are. Um, that in itself is complicated, uh, let alone if you have to assume that you have um, uh, relationships between each of these particular things to allow a patient to basically explicitly grant consent between each of these groups. Um, so I think ultimately, um, that level of fine-grained management of, of consent and authentication um, is not practical. Um, and so obviously the way that you could do this is factor out the consent at some level. So basically have a shared authentication service um, that then could issue tokens to access uh, medical data, but these tokens could be validated not only by one uh, holder of, fire, uh, of information via fire, but multiple. Um, so a, a, uh, a patient would, uh, wishing to access data from one particular uh, location, or a clinician for a clinical application, um, uh, wishing to access data from one location, would log in through uh, a shared OAuth service that is uh, uh, valid for a number of different services. Um, that itself would uh, hold a database of consent and rules about how delegation could work. Um, it would have some consent management interface to it um, that would allow patients in order to, um, uh, to choose what level of consent they have up to the, the development of that application, how you would actually manage uh, the level at which those consents are changed. Uh, and it, based on, on the, uh, the credentials passed in, the scope saying what I would like to access, we could go off, check the patient consent rules, return a token, and that same token could be exchanged uh, against these fire endpoints from a number of different providers um, in order to return patient data. Uh, and that would work because these providers have all decided that they would trust this one particular shared um, authentication engine. Um, so the obvious question there that I'm not going to make a statement about, um, like as Martin earlier, is like, well, what level is that, that shared authentication mechanism? Um, because one, you know, one answer is, well, you do this nationally, um, and you build on something like gov.uk verify, and you have a single um, uh, login service, perhaps done by the NHS, um, and uh, by NHS Digital um, that could issue a token to everybody, um, return data. That's definitely one um, answer to the question. Um, the other answer to the question is, you know, individual hospitals could do it. A huge time investment for them, but you know, maybe if you work at an individual hospital, then it would work for all of those care providers. Um, maybe the, there is a middle level. And that middle level is more at the level of something like what you see emerging with the Great North Care Record or something like that. Maybe it is a community of groups, that maybe, I don't know, two to five million people, um, that uh, pull together and they themselves um, have a, uh, provide both not only the shared uh, authentication point, um, but also uh, the ability for patients to manage their consent roles and say, who do I allow data to be delegated to, for what reasons? Um, and I think probably doing it at some kind of mid-level you know, gives you both the uh, flexibility. For example, we talked earlier about um, uh, 
uh, uh, Caldecott three and those consent things. You know, that's, that's a, you know that implies kind of a, uh, a national level consent database. Um, those consents are going to be high level. If you look at what hospitals do at the moment, most hospitals for research and things also ask for collection of tissue samples, consent to contact for um, uh, follow up on experiments, and that's not something that's ever going to be covered nationally. I doubt. Um, so there's going to have to be some kind of middle ground between those two worlds, and perhaps this is one way of doing it technically. Um, but of course, this granting and delegation of consent um, that happens here is itself um, a very sensitive topic. Uh, and it too should be subject to exactly the same levels of audit and verifiability uh, I mentioned earlier. And so you can imagine um, a world where um, not only does that, uh, the uh, central authority issue consent for a bunch of different uh, providers, but also logs the fact that it has issued consent for those things and the reasons why it's allowed access. Um, and you know, those reasons could be because it's a third party organization that the group trusts, um, because somebody triggered a break glass emergency flow because they needed to override the consent of a particular patient um, based on a clinical emergency. Uh, and, um, and I think fitting it all together, you kind of uh, end up in that state where um, you kind of pull together these different things. You need to know uh, any application that uh, needs to get uh, a single unified view of um, data for a particular patient, first of all can work out, well, in this uh, loose collection of groups who hold uh, medical data about me, uh, who does hold medical data about me? Who do I need to go off and, uh, and contact? The second is, um, can I get consent to access that data? Um, through an open standard to get back these tokens. Having actually worked out where the data is and gained consent to access this data, you can go and access that data. And in doing that, um, you produce uh, log entries that are verifiable so that later on somebody can actually go through uh, and verify that the reason why you are accessing that data was actually um, within uh, the constraints of the original consent granted by the patient to avoid that trust. Um, so I think there's a lot of stuff there that is is difficult to build, not only technically and standards based, but um, uh, but from a user research perspective and understanding, you know, how do we actually communicate this sensibly to patients? What data we need to make this kind of understandable? Um, but in the world that we're increasingly heading to, where you know at the moment, location of data is used as a proxy for what that organization can do with that data, which is why you know, there's such concern about moving data around. And, and that in itself is a big blocker. Um, we really need to move to a, uh, a world where the location of data is actually just a technical consideration of the design. And the location is only there in, in, in order to actually implement the system. And what matters is how that data is used. And is that data used within the consents and rules of the patient who actually had that data in the first place? Uh, and I think that's where we end, to end up in the future. And I think with that, I'm going to let you hand over to the rest of the evening's festivities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. I think you've um, generated as many questions for us as you've given us answers, but lots to think about tomorrow.